Okay, well, uh, good evening everyone, uh, and a very warm welcome to this event, Life Gamified Practices of the Quantified Self, which is part of the Arts and Humanities uh, Festival 2016. Uh, my name is Ptihaj Ajana, and I am a senior lecturer here at King's College, uh, and also a Marie Curie Fellow at Aarhus University. Uh, I'm very delighted to be joined by three fantastic panelists. So first we have Paolo Rufino, who is lecturer in Media Studies uh, at the University of Lincoln. Federica Lucivero, who is a Marie Curie Fellow at the Department of Social Sciences, Health and Medicine at King's College London. Uh, and Maria Hatshis Christodoulou, also known as Maria X, uh, who is uh, Associate Professor in Performance and New Media at the London South Bank University. Uh, so before we start our discussions, I would like to give you just a brief overview on the structure of this event. Uh, so first of all, we will start with uh, individual short presentations uh, where I will be starting by introducing you to uh, two major concepts that underpin uh, this event, namely gamification and the quantified self. And after our individual presentations, we will proceed to our panel discussions, followed by a Q&A session where you will have the opportunity to ask us uh, questions that you may have. And at the end of the event, you are warmly welcome to join us at a reception, which will be taking place at the chapters uh, at the end of the corridor from here. Um, so what we will be doing together is uh, to discuss this growing phenomenon that is uh, the gamification of life itself. And what this term tries to convey is that increasingly many of our uh, daily activities, such as work, uh, learning, exercising, shopping, dating, and so on, are increasingly being imbued with playful elements that almost turns them into a game in themselves. And oftentimes, this is happening through um, digital technologies and smart mobile devices. So in each of our individual presentations, we will be uh, addressing a particular aspect of this uh, gamification or a particular life sphere where gamification is applied or even resisted, as is the case with Maria's uh, presentation. <coughs> so to begin with, what is gamification? So um, gamification is the process of applying game-based techniques and game-based elements such as uh, digital points or badges or virtual award in a non-game context such as the workplace. And although play and games are often uh, perceived as the opposite to work or as the opposite of serious tasks, they are nevertheless being integrated increasingly into many spheres of daily life including work itself. So here you can see many familiar names uh, of companies such as Amazon, Samsung, IBM, Target and Microsoft that are increasingly uh, integrating elements of digital games into their day-to-day -day business activities in order to engage uh, employees and customers uh, with their product or with their kind of operations. So gamification in this sense is becoming a popular means, a popular tools to increase motivation and engagement, uh, to institute uh, team competition, and also to reward individual as well as uh, group performance at the workplace and beyond. Uh, relatedly and also importantly, the location of play as a result of gamification is also changing. No longer is play confined to um, playgrounds or living rooms or arcade halls or parks, but it is becoming a uh, part and parcel of the center of, of our cultural, economic, social, and even political uh, daily life. As uh, Latitude Research puts it, the world around us will become the ultimate playing field. And for instance, the recent astonishing success and uh, popularity of the game Pokemon Go is a testimony in itself as to how the convergence of digital technologies uh, together with augmented realities, location-based technologies and mobile media are actually uh, interweaving the virtual with the physical uh, and bringing play right at the heart of our daily activities. Just a week, over a week ago, uh, the Norwegian Prime Minister herself, she was spotted playing Pokemon Go in the middle of a parliament meeting, which is a striking example no doubt. <laughs> 
Uh, and related to that as well, the profile of the gamer is also changing. It is no longer about this uh, stereotypical image of the teenage boy or the reclusive gamer who is um, locked in his room or in the basement with a console or a PC, but now the profile of the gamer is evolving and it is expanding to subsume just about anyone and everyone. So perhaps all of us here are gamers in one way or another, perhaps without even being aware of it. Just the fact that we use, for instance, uh, our mobile devices, our smartphones to go from A to Z on Google Maps and, and, and so on, that turns us into gamers um, as well. Um, so at the surface and at first glance, uh, gamification may come across as uh, a very positive and welcome trend and development. I mean, after all, isn't it wonderful to be able to experience our daily boring chores uh, as games instead? Isn't it more enjoyable to infuse our daily tasks, our serious daily tasks, with playful elements? But as many studies have shown, uh, there is a dark side to gamification as well. Uh, for instance, addiction, obsessiveness, aggression, are that some of the recurring issues um, that many uh, academic um, texts and, and works have actually mentioned in their analysis of the implications of gamification uh, and digital games. Also, um, critics have been bemoaning the decrease in time that people are spending in outdoor play or in face-to-face -face interactions as a result of the prolonged use of digital media and digital games. Although I can argue the way around as well, I think with Pokemon Go what we are witnessing is the opposite because Pokemon Go encourages people to go out and walk around and, and play together rather than alone, play as a group, not just individually. So I think games are becoming uh, more and more social rather than individualized or individualizing. Um, critics are also picking up on how gamification is intensifying forms of surveillance at the workplace, for instance, because they are providing employers with additional tools and means to bring the performance and productivity of their employees and the, the constant watchful gaze of management. And gamification is also um, blurring the lines between what is social life and what is private life and bringing leisure time into the sphere of labor as well. And for instance, many employee, employers now are encouraging their employee to embrace this corporate wellness schemes whereby many digital de like health devices are being given to employees in order to uh, increase their activity and encourage them to lead a healthier life. So exercise and health is becoming a corporate concern rather than a personal private matter. Gamification as well can be described as a war on boredom. But the question is, is it always necessary to, to try to evade and escape boredom? Boredom that is an intrinsic human condition. Maybe the skill is to learn to live with boredom and to be alone with it and to be okay with that, rather than constantly seeking to escape it through digital games and gamification. And some of these uh, notes here, we will go back to them in uh, individual presentations as well as in our um, uh, panel discussion. But for now, I would like now to introduce you to the other concept that underpins this uh, event, which is the quantified self. Back in 2007, Kevin Kelly and Gary Wolf from Wired Magazine founded a so-called movement called the quantified self, whose motto, as you can see there, is self-knowledge through numbers. Uh, and since its beginning, the, the group has grown to include over 200 meetup groups spread out around uh, more than 100 cities across the world. And now the term is, described, is used to describe uh, any form of self-tracking, life logging and activity uh, tracking. Uh, and one of the founding principles of this, of this movement is that unless something can be measured, it cannot be improved. So the underlying assumption that underpins uh, the quantified self is that through the collection and computation of data regarding our physical activity, our, our uh, biological characteristics, our um, kind of behavior, we can be incited to uh, improve our performance and to become basically a better version of ourselves. So in many ways, uh, 
the quantified self can be described as a gamification of physical activity, whereby our very vital functions, such as sleep, uh, food intake, calorie expenditure, glucose level, uh, body fat percentage, and so on, can be made amenable to measurement, uh, tracking, monitoring, uh, analysis, and ultimately improvement. So, um, to illustrate some of these points, I would like now to uh, show you uh, a very short video uh, which really demonstrates quite well the level of engagement that a self-quantifier can have with uh, the self-tracking practices and how the self-tracking practices become part and parcel of daily routine of, of the user. And this is a, a video about a guy called Bob uh, Troya. Uh, who is now uh, a very prominent member of the quantified self in the US, but also beyond, giving his uh, enthusiastic embrace of self-tracking culture in every uh, sphere of his life. This is 41-year-old Bob Troya sometimes sleeps with this gadget on his head. So when he wakes up, he can see not only how long he slept, but also information so detailed, he knows when and how long he was in REM sleep, light sleep, and deep sleep. I'll tell them to have like a little pointer on 6 a.m. where my dog tends to bark at somebody, so and then I'll fall back asleep. And this is just the start of Troya's data-filled morning routine. Before he even gets out of bed, Troya uses an iPhone app to take his pulse. He then weighs himself, takes his blood pressure, and his blood glucose level. I have an elevated risk for type 2 diabetes, Next, a finger tapping exercise to test cognitive performance. And all throughout the day, a monitor on his chest and a band on his wrist collect data about his heart rate, sweat levels, and skin temperature so he can keep his stress levels in check. So I can look down at my phone at any point in the day and see how at any moment I'm stressed in my day. All the data he collects is stored in a computer program, smartphone app, or on a spreadsheet. The point of all this tracking and monitoring? Troya, the CEO of a marketing firm who lives in Brooklyn, says in addition to keeping diabetes at bay, he just wants to stay healthy. I think as you get older, um, you know, once I think really when I turned 40, for me was, um, you know, start looking ahead. So I think by the sort of idea for me is doing whatever I can take to ensure that I have this sort of long, enjoyable life. Troya's tracking and testing may seem extreme, but he's definitely not alone. He's part of a growing movement called Quantified Self people tracking and quantifying all kinds of personal data, often health-related. 60% of American adults track their weight, diet, or exercise routine. Every step you take. And millions are now using technology to do it. There are thousands of health and fitness smartphone apps, and it's estimated the wearable device industry could grow to more than a billion dollars, including these bands and bits that track everything steps in calories to heart rate and sleep quality. It's about self-improvement. David Pogue is a technology columnist for the New York Times and host of Nova Science Now. Is there any way to give your own brain a boost? He says self-quantifiers range from the average person just trying to lose weight to the hardcore like Bob Troya. Pogue says these wearable devices can be powerful motivators. Just that awareness that you're being watched and your activity levels being monitored leads you to get more activity. You take more stairs, you get off a subway stop earlier because they reward you with little lights and graphs for, for doing well. Pogue says many devices also let you compare your data with other users. So there's a, an almost competitive element to it. It's, it's fitness through shame. Well, what is it about that baseline sort of competition? Like it's almost like an animal instinct. Why do we respond to that? I mean, everybody behaves differently when they're on stage versus when they're off stage. You want to be your best self. You want to put your best foot forward. And that's what sharing your data with. All right, I mean, you this get This is the, actually. You get the point. <laughs> so yes, I mean, through this, this example, we can see how this self-tracking practices can really inf infiltrate every aspect of one's life, such as work, health, exercise, and the domestic sphere as well, as we can see here. Um, and in fact, and perhaps more alarmingly, uh, self-tracking practices are now even infiltrating our sphere of intimacy through the spread of apps and devices 
that allow users to assess the sexual performance, so to speak, uh, and it provides them with suggestions as to how to improve their sexual life uh, and so on and so forth. Um, so there are two examples, for instance, is the this device called Lovely and another app called Spreadsheets, both of which are turning sex into a game. So I would like to show you just one more um, video of the promotional video of Spreadsheets app. It's based on many stereotypes, but it shows how technology is being promoted as a way to incite uh, couples to have more sex and to playfully assess their sexual fitness, uh, so to say. Je me 